Good to be here back in person. Um, so today we're going to talk about a couple of things. We're going to be talking about um, workflow identity. We're going to be talking about multi-cloud. Uh, and more specifically, we're going to be talking about the multi-cloud access problem and how we're going to solve this with workflow identity and technologies such as Spiffy, Spire, and Tanya. So before we go ahead, a little quick introduction. Uh, my name is Brandon, and I'm here with my colleague Marush, and we are both from IBM Research. And today we are going to start by telling you a bit more about workload identity, uh, how it works in um, a cloud provider. We're then going to bring this into multi-cloud context, and we're going to talk about solutions that work today uh, and some of their limitations. And then we are going to introduce this notion of a universal or organization-wide identity, of which we have a really cool demo for you. So we have a lot of content to dive into, so let's go ahead. Um, so let's first introduce the concept of workload identity by looking at uh, the, ana the anatomy of a workload identity within a context of a single cloud. So every cloud provider kind of handles uh, workload identity in a similar way. Um, so each of them have, has an identity provider that comes in the form of a root of trust or certificate authority. Uh, this certificate authority then issues identities um, through the form of usually some kind of infrastructure service, such as, you know, for AWS, example would be uh, the AWS metadata service. So we then have a workload that's running on, let's say, Kubernetes or OpenShift. Uh, this container that wants to access a service, such as a database, uh, what they have to do is then they have to talk to the service to obtain a workload identity that comes in the form of usually an X509 certificate or JWT token. They then present this to the identity and access management on the top of the cloud. And because you know, the cloud is well integrated with itself, it's able to authenticate uh, the workload identity and provide access seamlessly. So now let's talk about this in terms of multi-cloud. In this scenario, we have um, an organization example where we have three different clouds. We have IBM Cloud, we have S0 and AWS in blue, green, and yellow respectively. So we notice that if a workload kind of lives within its own silo, we don't really have that much of a problem. And in fact, within a single cloud, uh, IAM identity and access management is pretty much a solved problem. However, the difficulty comes in when we want to do multi-cloud access, when we want to access a resource from one cloud um, from a workload in another. Example of this is I want to access an AWS S3 bucket um, from a workload in IBM Cloud. Um, so let's talk about how this is done today, right? So the first method is um, long, using long-lived credentials. Uh, this is probably something that most have done before, myself included. And what this involves is, um, you know, for example, if I want to access um, Azure Cosmos DB uh, as a resource from IBM Cloud, um, what I would do is I'll go up to the Azure service, say, uh, please create an API key for me or some long-lived credential. Uh, and myself as, as an administrator would take this API key, which is just a bunch of um, bytes. I'm going to create a Kubernetes secret. I'm going to mount it into my workload, and my workload will then be able to access the service. So this technique is, is great because it's very simple. It's really easy to get started. Uh, unfortunately, it comes with several uh, caveats. So one of which is we are using a long-lived credential. That means that it's very difficult to manage the risk. Uh, if there's, a, there's an incident that happens, it's difficult to measure the blast radius. Um, the second part of this is that, as we saw, we kind of had to trust uh, an administrator or component such as myself in order to handle these uh, highly privileged credentials. And therefore, we are putting a lot of trust in a single admin or single component, which in compliance cases can lead to a lot of complications. So the next method of doing this is through cloud federation. Um, the idea behind federation is fairly simple. It means that we want to teach an IAM system for one cloud uh, how to um, interpret and how to authenticate identities from another. Right? Uh, this is usually done by protocols such as OIDC, or taking the trust bundles or certificate authorities and then moving them to the next cloud. And this is great, right? Because we are still using the short-lived credentials from the cloud. Uh, we don't need administrators or any intermediaries that come and 
you know, handle these credentials. Awesome, talk's over. <laughs> so, unfortunately, the, this is not the case. Um, so there are several problems with federation today. So the first is that uh, federation uh, support kind of varies within, uh, within the clouds. If I want to access a GCP resource from AWS uh, with Google Cloud's identity pool service, uh, this can be done fairly easily. However, if we want to do the opposite, this is a fairly involved process, and this blog post uh, linked here actually describes you know, what you need to do. It's you need to install a bunch of things in your know, Kubernetes cluster and so on. Um, so besides that, um, secondly, each cloud does workload identities or defines workload identities slightly differently. So every cloud provider has its own identity scheme. It may contain a bunch of attributes. It may contain policy IDs, security group IDs, and things like that. Um, the issue with this is that some of these fields may not have meaning in other clouds. For example, AWS security group IDs, when we see it from an IBM cloud perspective or Azure perspective, don't really have any meaning. And what this results in is it becomes difficult uh, to manage uh, identities or to create meaningful access policies across clouds within your organization. And lastly comes the problem of scale. So um, we are doing cloud-to-cloud -cloud federation. So we can see that, for example, just with three individual clouds, if we federate all of them, we end up having to maintain six different trust relationships. And this is not even considering you know, what happens if one cloud provider decides to add something into its identity scheme or decides to change some attributes of its identity. So to be able to solve this problem, um, we don't have to look too far to draw inspiration. In fact, if we ask ourselves, um, if we look at user identities and ask ourselves, how do we, how do we address the problem of user identities? And the answer to that is done organization-wide or globally. When we think about a user, John, for example, we don't think about John as John AWS, John IBM Cloud, John GCP. Uh, we think about John from development. He's a funny guy. You know, <laughs> he, he uh, has access to these bunch of clouds, right? Um, and so the question is, why don't we treat our workload identities the same way, right? Um, applications and services are, after all, organizational constructs. Right. Why are we married to this idea that workload identity has to be tied to the platform? So how do we do that with workloads? So to do this, um, we, um, we say we want to have a universal or organization-wide workload identity. So what this means is that first, I need to define a, an identity scheme for my entire organization. So one identity scheme, in this example, we take from um, the Spiffy book, we can see it has the name of the organization, uh, it has a region, so maybe we can use compliance or compliance controls, uh, whether it's dev staging prod, and also the department or the project in which the workload belongs to. Another part of creating an organization uh, wide workload identity is you want to really minimize the points of federation, so you have a single point of federation. So this is great because it helps reduce risk of misconfiguration because Operators only need to deal with one scheme, and they only have to deal with one federation point. So now that we want this, how do we go about doing it? And we're going to introduce this concept of a zero trust uh, workload identity management platform. Um, I know zero trust is like a very overused word. Um, in this case, when we say zero trust, we just mean that everything's authenticated and tested um, throughout. Um, so what do we need out of this platform in order to uh, make universal worker identity work? So first of all, we need to be able to define uh, what the identity scheme is. We need a way to enforce the identity scheme through our organization. Um, it is also as important that we make sure that uh, workloads get the correct credentials and the workloads with the correct credentials um, really uh, have been attested and we can prove that um, it is they are who they say. And last but not least, because uh, after all, we want to alleviate the, the management problem, we want to have a single point of federation to all the cloud services. 
And how we're going to do this is we're going to use uh, Spiffy, Spire, and Tonyak. So, all right, I'll, I'll give you a bit more. <laughs> there we go. Awesome. So let's meet the technology. So, so these three projects are all uh, CNCF projects under the Spiffy umbrella. Uh, I won't have time to go too much into detail, but so Spiffy, first off, is um, the secure production identity framework for everyone. Um, it is kind of like the identity spec. It defines how workloads can securely obtain their identities. Uh, we have Spire, that is the implementation and imp implementation of Spiffy. Uh, in this case, it provides the zero trust attestations of the workloads and the infrastructure, as well as together with the OIDC discovery service provides a point of federation. And last but not least, we have Tonyak, which is a control plane slash UI for Spire. And together with the Kubernetes workload registrar, it provides a way to define uh, the universal workload identity and enforce it. So the, our claim is that if you install a zero trust workload identity management platform, and you kind of exercise this notion of organization-wide or universal workload identity, um, you're going to get all the great stuff that we talked about. And in, in, in addition to that, you're going to be able to centrally manage as well as audit all your workload identities. So with that, I'm going to pass it on to Marius, that is going to show, who is going to show you a really cool demo. Okay. Thank you, Brendan, for the great overview. So let's take a look at our hypothetical uh, scenario of several Kubernetes clusters, and they are deployed in different clouds. We have Microsoft here, Amazon, IBM Cloud. Then we deploy workloads that need to access the S3 storage bucket. So we will demonstrate that using universal workload identity, this task is very simple and very secure. So first, we need to stand up the identity management service with Spire and Torniak to manage all the organization workloads and all the identities in the cluster. Then we deploy Spire agents as daemon sets with one uh, agent per each node in every cluster. Then every agent, agent is attested with the Spire server. For attestation, we are using cloud provider specific plugins, or attestation that is based on Kubernetes platform. This solution is giving us zero trust attestation for underlying infrastructure. Next, we use the Kubernetes workload registrar that automates the process of creating universal workload identities for all the workloads in the organization. All the agent attested workload identities can be easily viewed and managed from one location, which is the Torniak interface. Once we have the universal identity schema using the open ID to federate these identities uh, across, we can use this uh, for uh, federating across all the, all the clouds. Now we can create and manage policies uh, that control access uh, for the all organizational workloads for uh, uh, to access to uh, uh, storage, for example. So in our quick demo, we will show you how to enable the identity provider in Amazon, how to set up the policy and role for guarding the access to S3 storage buckets, and then we'll demonstrate the workload running in IBM Cloud that is requesting the universal Spiffy ID for itself from the agent, and then using this identity to request access to the storage. So here's the example of the universal workload identity that we use for our organization. It's composed of the trust domain that represents the organization, uh, the name of the region, cluster, namespace, service account, and pod name. So here's just the example. Uh, just for fun, we use the OpenShift in SpaceX 
that is running in East, US East uh, region. The cluster name is TSI Cube 01, uh, default namespace, and Elon Musk uh, uh, service account. So now we can define policies that would guard access to the S3 storage. So in this example, we want the region to be, to must be in US location. We can use any Kubernetes cluster. However, the uh, namespace must be mission and service account Elon Musk, and the pod must start with the Mars mission name. Okay, so let's do a quick demo. Good? Okay, so let's start with the Torniak interface. So if you look at uh, the, the navigation bar, we have a management for clusters, agents, we can list and uh, manage the entries. There is a section for uh, server information and the do, uh, dashboard, ta uh, Torniak dashboard. So let me just go to the clusters and here we go. We manage six different clusters and they are deployed in different locations, different clouds. So for example, we have here Amazon, this is Azure, and there are a few in IBM Cloud. Some of them are OpenShift and others are just a native Kubernetes. Okay, if we click here on Torniak Info, you can see that this Spire server is defined with node attesters. And right here we have one for Kubernetes, there's one for Amazon and Azure. Okay, if we click here on the dashboard, oops, sorry. Uh, when we click here on dashboard, we can view here agents, workloads, and uh, all the clusters. So let's go to one of the clusters. We're going to use the TSI Cube 01, which is in IBM Cloud. Right here, details, and here we go. We have three nodes with three different agents. They are all attested, you can see here. Let's look at the entries. So there is one entry here. This is the re workload registrar that automates the entries uh, for all the workloads that would be created here. Okay, so before I show the demo on the, how we create the workloads and get the access, let me just show you quickly what we've done on Amazon site. So here is our Mars uh, bucket, it's called Mars Spire, and there is a special file called Mars TXT which is the sensitive file that we want to protect. So this is what we want to uh, govern. Okay, so next we go to identity management for Amazon. And right here, I'm going to just copy this guy. Bigger, okay. okay thank you. Okay, so we're going to create identity provider. So let me just click on provider. Open ID connect type. And I'm going to use the URL of the Spire server. Get the thumbprint. Okay, here we go. It works. We define the audience. Let's say my S3. I guess that's it. Add the provider. Okay, done. So we just created ourselves ourselves identity provider. So let me look all of them, you see the, all of them. Okay, this is the guy, SpaceX 03. Okay, so we've done this already earlier. So let me show you how we define policies. So there's one X05 that we would, would be using further. So let's click on the roles. Okay, there's role called Mars mission. Okay, what roles do, they basically tie the policies with the identity provider. So let me show you how the policy looks like. Come on. All right. So there is a policy that defines uh, read access to the Mars Spire bucket, the one that I showed you earlier. And let's look at the trust relationship for this identity provider. Here are the conditions. So the conditions that we defined for this experiment are following. It has to be OpenShift SpaceX uh, organization. The region must be US, so it has to begin with the US prefix. 
and the cluster name, uh, Mars, uh, I'm sorry, mission, namespace, Elon Musk, service account, and Mars mission, the pod name, okay? So we're done here. Now let's go to the, to the cluster. So this is the blue cluster. This is the IBM cluster. So from here, let me show you, there's nothing running yet. All right, so let's create. Okay. okay, Mars demo. Okay, so what we just did, we created a service account, Elon Musk, and then deployed a Mars mission uh, on this account. Okay, so let me, all right, it's running right here. Okay, let's now get inside. All right, and we have a just quick script because I don't want to talk and type at the same time. So let me just show this demo script. So the first operation, we're going to retrieve the JWT token, which is basically the identity of this container. So let's do that. And here is the identity in a text format. Let's take a uh, look at, at it. So we have OpenShift space X, that's the domain, that's the organization. Region is running in US South, cluster name TSI Cube 01, namespace mission, Elon Musk as a service account and the pad name. Okay, so in theory, that should comply with the policy that we created earlier. And this chunk over here, that's the JWT token. So let's retrieve this guy into a file. All right, it's done. Now, we can invoke the call to a AWS to copy the file from this uh, bucket. So let's do this. As you can see, we are using the role Mars mission. We pass the, ident the JWT token that was captured a minute ago, and we're just simply asking for a file and copy it locally. So let's see if it was delivered, it's done. Let's just look what's inside, and here you go. You have a recipe for the concentrated dark matter from the Rick and Morty series. Okay, so before I go, I would like to show you quickly that we could now go back to our super cool Torniak. Okay, here we go. Where was it, the clusters, TSI Cube 01. Okay, and here you go. This is new identity that was created. You can see, you can easily see it from Torniak and so are the other ones. Okay, back to the presentation. Okay, so in our demo, you could see how easy it is to uh, get identities in one place from all the multiple uh, clusters, multiple different clouds, and one policy allows access enforcement for several dynamically created workloads. In fact, in our multi-cluster organization, if you invoke the same calls in any of the clusters, you should get exactly the same results. In theory, assuming that policy uh, complies with the identity of the workload. Okay, so we also have a demo that shows the same uh, concept, but this time using Vault and for retrieving secrets from Vault. So in interest of time, I suggest going to the recording that will be listed at the end of the presentation. So just to summarize, the universal zero trust workload identity runs on everything that supports Kubernetes. It strengthens the security by executing cloud provider specific attestation, as well as the platform attestation. And it can support uh, different identity mechanisms like uh, IAM, Keycloak, uh, open standards like OpenID, using consistent uh, universal identity schema. So Brendan, back to you. All right, cool. So, uh... 
Um, just a little little bit before we end. So um, the project that you saw the UI is Tonyak. Uh, this is something that Marish and I started working on um, pretty recently. Uh, we are both maintaining it, but we are also looking for more maintainers um, that are not IBM as well, help the governance. Um, <clears throat> it's fairly, it's, it's still in um, development, so there's a lot to do. There's, it's going really fast. Uh, there's a lot of cool things to, that we're going to work on, such as you know, integrating with the, uh, the policies as well as aggregating logs. Um, we are open to a lot of feedback. Tell us what you think, um, as well as if you like what you saw in the demo that Marish gave. Um, we have Helm charts to kind of like help you redeploy the whole thing, um, as well as we have a bunch of YouTube videos that kind of show a little bit more than what uh, we have time to show today. So if not, um, yeah, let's start shepherding our cloud native cattle. Um, and I think there is one uh, talk that that's after after this around um, talking a little bit more about how to define the Spiffy IDs. If not, thank you very much. <laughs>